its importance. It is indispensable tool. I'll show you why. Let's see. Let's say uh, this is this was the person who came to me. As you can see, this person has a really uh, bad oral hygiene, and there were there were carious lesions just near the gingival one third. Let's assume if we are doing this restoration without isolation, without such field, whether we'll be able to focus on restoration. Because if it is not isolated, you will be like uh, your hand will be retracting the lip, other hand will be holding the suction. So your attention is diverted. And when your attention is diverted, you can't do a quality work because you need to pay focus, you need to pay attention, you should be focused on minute details of the restoration. So that is why a clean and dry isolation is very much important as you can see in this one furthermore a clean and dry isolation lays down or sets the mood just imagine uh, when we were in school and the school used to reopen in june and july so each one of us will try to put good handwriting on the front few new uh, pages of the new book in a similar manner if our work and isolation is clean it sets the mood to do clean work Similarly, assume, let's say, if I want to do a pre-endodontic buildup in this particular premolar, as you can see, there is a lot of bleeding going around. So obviously, without isolation, it won't be possible to do a proper composite restoration. So in this case, we isolated, and now, as you can see, that all bleeding is, there is bleeding, but it is underneath the rubber dam, and rubber dam is like holding or it is embracing the neck, neck of the tooth very tightly and it is not allowing any fluid or saliva to uh, to leach to, uh, to leach and uh, profuse out ooze out next part once we have done the isolation the next part is proper excavation composite or any resin for that matter will bond to the tooth surface only and only if it is clean so we need a proper clean tooth substrate when I say tooth sub substrate, it involves both enamel and dentine. And to have a proper clean tooth substrate, we need to do proper excavation. This is this is not something a uh, rule of thumb. This is something uh, which I have compiled for the ease of communication and uh, for uh, for us to easily understand a kind of simple flowchart. What what steps I follow during excavation? So. In the, during the excavation, as soon as I see the case, I look for the color. I look for the discrepancies in the color because a carious tooth wo won't appear homogeneous. There will be loss of integrity. There will be grayish appearance. There will be uh, shallow kind of appearance. Then once I have taken care of all the color thing, then I'll come to the texture. And finally, in the third part, I will remove all thin tooth structure. So we'll look at the color. As you can see in this tooth, uh, I'll move my cursor on this part here. Yeah. On the buccal side, you can see the tooth color looks very much compact, homogeneous. As compared to this transverse ridge, if you look at this transverse ridge, you will see that it appears uh, undermined. You can see kind of a grayish shadow underneath it. What does it suggest? It suggests that there is there is caries underneath that transverse ridge and, um, and probably the tooth, sub, tooth structure underneath that enamel is undermined. Furthermore, if you can see the proximal boxes, they're all, all, almost cavitated grossly and you can see the brown and black appearance. The same tooth from side view and here we can appreciate that gray part which was which was underneath the transverse ridge, that is the caries. Furthermore, you can see the enamel. It is kind of a leathery, soft in texture appearing. And this is the important part, dentino enamel junction. It appears white, frosty, because this is the part which is demineralized. The here enamel at DEJ is demineralized. So all this thing is weak tooth structure and it is not good for bonding. And we are going to remove all this. The leathery kind of dentine, the brown dentine, the blackish hue, the unsupported enamel, or the frosty dentino enamel junction, we are going to remove each and everything. 
So after isolation, we did some gross excavation following our cues by the color. So we removed the transverse ridge, we removed the part of mesial and distal proximal box, but still you can see the dentin is not looking kind of compact or tough. Now here we'll be focusing on the texture of the tooth. And what I mean by texture, you will be able to appreciate better in the next following picture. Yes, so I have zoomed this picture well enough. Now you can see that the texture of the dentin here was leathery, kind of mushy, and in in the way we, we used to uh, the way we used to discuss in our dental school time that it is scrapable, right? It is scrapable and it is not hard. It is infected dentin. So we use our slow speed hand, hand piece or spoon excavator or whichever the instrument which we have, uh, which we feel better with, comfortable with, because it's not necessary. See, dentistry is an art. It is my personal opinion that a person uh, should, should take the knowledge of all the instrument, but rather be comfortable using the instrument than just blindly follow. So if you're comfortable with spoon excavator, go ahead with spoon excavator. If you feel you're better with the rotary instrument, whether it's low speed or high speed, your end result should be in main focus rather than the tools. You should be the master of the tools. Here in this case, I have not used any slow speed instrument and this particular tooth was uh, scheduled for endodontic treatment and this particular stage is just uh, pre-endodontic, just before the pre-endodontic buildup. Another point which was in my steps, steps of caries excavation I mentioned was thickness. So let's, let's assume I am pointing my cursor here. Let's assume on this mesial side, there is caries. On this distal side, there is caries. If I keep on excavating this mesial and distal, ultimately the portion at this top part, at this uh, portion at this top part will be kind of very thin. And then and any tooth structure which is less than two millimeter, which is thick, which is less than two millimeter thick is not good for bonding. It is weak and pliable. So any portion of the tooth structure after caries excavation, which looks like it is less than two millimeters should be reduced and whatever is left should be thick and healthy tooth substrate. This will ensure a proper strong bonding. This will lay down a strong foundation for a good restoration. Similarly, uh, we in composite restoration, we don't want any unsupported enamel rods. We don't want any, any soft debris or uh, plaque as we can't see plaque, but uh, it's worth mentioning here. Furthermore, as in the previous slide, we mentioned that we don't want the dentino enamel junction, which is which is demineralized, and you can see clearly here that the DEJ is demineralized. There's another factor. We want our all line angles and all the outlines of the tooth or of the cavity. We want them to be flared. We want them to be smooth and rounded. So here I have flared and rounded all the edges. Sometimes the gingival seed area, sometimes it's difficult to clean it or to smooth it with the burr. So in such cases, I use a proximal abrasive strips, the one we use for uh, composite finishing. And with using that, we can easily make it smooth. So once we have taken care of uh, Katie's excavation coming to plaque. Actually, this step can be done before excavation. Sometimes it can be done after excavation, right? Uh, plaque is something we all know the plaque is tenaciously adhered to the tooth surface. It is, it is not visible to eye, but it doesn't mean it's not present. A patient has caries. It means patient had food lodgement. It obviously means that there will be plaque. So, First of all, uh, we will use a plaque disclosing agent and look for the plaque substrate. This is especially more important when we are doing a diastema closure kind of restorations because interdentally there will be plaque and which may not be properly seen by eye. So we need to use a plaque disclosing agent and then remove the plaque. How can we remove the plaque? The best method, the best method is sand blasting we have a huge variety of sand blasting equipments in the market and they provide us uh, more they more control they provide us our control over the 
thickness particle size of the abrasive agent over the pressure and other things so with better control we will able we will be able to properly remove the plaque but again we it's not necessary that each one of us or all the clinician may have this instrument or the equipment so the persons or the person who don't have the sand blasting should can use a simple pumis or a polishing paste and uh, use it with regular polishing cups and brush to remove the plaque and as i said the plaque which is present interdentally we are our rotary the polishing cups and the brush won't be able to go or won't won't be able to access this nooks and crannies of interproximal spaces for those things we will be using this abrasive uh, strips now we should uh, we should be very much cautious and be judicious uh, judicious with our movements with this strips because we are we are just trying to remove the soft debris plaque and make the tooth uh, clean we are not trying to remove the enamel or change the shape of the tooth so once the plaque is taken care of next step that comes is etching proper etching now there are different techniques they say we in theoretically speaking they say we have self etch technique we have etch and rinse technique but in my opinion uh there is nothing like self etch first let me speak something about this bonding agent generations we have like fourth generation fifth generation sixth and seventh in fourth generation obviously it comes under etch and rinse technique we have acid etch then we have primer and adhesive in fifth generation again we have acid etch but the primer and adhesive are in a single bottle in sixth generation the primer itself is acidic and that is why they call it self etch technique but the acids that are present in the primer are not strong enough to etch the enamel they are weak acids and similarly even in the seventh generation and any any uh, any further bonding agents which have acidic primer they are not strong enough to cure, uh, etch the enamel so even even if you are using a uh, self etch kind of bonding agents you need to etch the enamel separately with our regular phosphoric acid how long should we etch a tooth so usually it's some anywhere between 15 to 60 or 90 seconds is fine for etching a tooth but uh, here i would like to mention that a young tooth will be less clearosed there will be less secondary dentin formation in a young tooth and so we require less number of seconds in etching a young tooth as you can see in this uh, this patient was a young patient Uh, age somewhere around as far as i remember it was in 20s and uh, it, it was a young tooth so here i just etch for 20 or something seconds but let's say if a middle aged patient comes you can see there is lot of a uh, tr transparent and sclerotic dentin form this tooth was scheduled for endodontic treatment and uh, we are going to do a pre endodontic build up whenever you find a tooth with sclerotic dentin and a patient which is in 40s and 50 we can assume that we need to etch a little bit more as compared to the young tooth coming to the another tip tip number 5 that is selective etching now this is important selective etching is important because we don't want to over etch the dentin dentine tubules are very much sensitive to the acid we don't want excess of minerals to leach out of the dentine so we will be doing the selective etch technique what is selective etch technique we are etching the enamel more as compared to the dentine and how do we do that personally let's say yeah personally what i do is i'll start my uh, i'll start applying my acid etch gel from on the periphery let's say i start here and then i make my way along the periphery and as i am spreading or as i am applying acid etch gel on the periphery i start counting let's say for example 1 2 3 4 and by the time i come by, by the time i spear whole of the periphery it's somewhere around like roughly 15 or 20 seconds and once that is done once that is done i'll i'll apply 
on the dentine surface. I want to etch the dentine. It's not that I don't want to etch the dentine, but the amount of time I will be spending on etching the dentine will be less. And I'll spend only like, let's say five to seven seconds. So me, while I was applying on the periphery, almost 15 to 20 seconds are passed. And then furthermore, five or seven seconds on the dental purple core and all together it will be enough. And as we are, uh, we are talking about etch etching, I'll just like to mention this Dr. Professor T. Kusuyama, and he was the father of complete total etch technique. And I just came across this uh, fact recently, courtesy um, one of my friend, Dr. Muhammad Hissam Al Nabusi. Next is proper rinsing. Now this is not. This is uh, many of us will will think rinsing is not something very special, but I have included this particular step as a tip because I like to use this opportunity to share my experience. A few of my bad experience with improper rinsing because we think it's okay, fine. Rinsing is something very easy and we become lenient. And uh, I like to share one of the experience I completed my excavation procedure and by the time i completed the excavation my bottle the water in the bottle of the dental chair was complete was almost over and i was not aware of that i went ahead with my etch, applying etching and everything and as soon as as soon as i took my previous syringe to rinse off the acid edge there was no water so it was you you can't just use a cotton and rub off because again that will that won't remove complete total acid and by the time your assistant will bring a saline syringe or maybe fill up the bottle, you may end up etching the tooth more and we don't want that. There is another, uh, another thing that you need to keep in mind when you're doing a maxillary molar, let's say maxillary molar, there is a, a, uh, on the mesial side, there is a distal proximal caries, there is a, and you have applied acid, but at times, on the line angles, on the interior line angles, on the mesial side, which may, be, may not be accessible and visible properly, if we are lenient, we may end up we may end up uh, leaving some amount of acid on those surfaces. So, proper rinsing is important. Now, coming to the next part, before uh, before coming to the next step of the procedure, I like to introduce to all audience something called MMP inhibitors. What is MMP? Matrix metalloproteinase. These are uh, enzyme and as the name suggests, enzymes which are present in matrix of the dentin, which are proteinase in nature, they will break down the proteins and they have a metallic component. So uh, here is the fact about them. Basically these are already present in the tooth while the formation of the tooth but they are after the formation of the tooth they become inactive and they become active they are activated only in acidic environment acidic environment now acidic environment are created by the bacteria in case of caries and also while we are using uh, acid edge will be creating acidic environment which will activate this matrix metalloproteinase now why are we discussing about it about this mmps and why are they important here is our hybrid layer. This is something, hybrid layer is something which connects or composite to the tooth surface, right? We have our primer acting as a bridge. We are, we are having our primer acting as a bridge between the dentine and the adhesive and the composite. Primer is having two, it is amph amphiphilic in nature. So it has one end, which is hydrophilic. Right, and our dentine has moisture so that hydrophilic end will be inside the dentine and tangling with the collagen fibers. And there will be another end which is hydrophobic. I think I can, I have tried to explain this one. Yeah, these green strands are, these green strands are hydro, uh, are, are the primer and they are acting as a bridge between the collagen fiber and the adhesive. The gray part is our adhesive which is hydrophobic. And the red part, is hydrophilic. So they are trying to hold on to one side, there is collagen matrix of the dentine, on the other side, there is adhesive. And our composite will be bonding to the adhesive. So 
let's assume if there are mmmps matrix metal of protein is activated in this area they will break down this collagen fibers and if they break down this collagen fiber they are degrading our hybrid layer this is the hybrid layer and if the hybrid layer is degraded over a period of time our bonding will fail so if our restoration is failing over a period of time this is because of the uh, degradation of or breaking down of the hybrid layer because of mmps now how can how can we stop mmps it is said uh, that chlorhexidine used during bonding inhibits mmp activity and thereby they increase the bond strength and reduce the degradation of hybrid layer and how do they do that chlorhexidine has a stronger affinity for calcium and zinc ions and when it comes in co con contact with this enzyme it takes away those zinc and calcium ions and when those ions are removed and we know that enzymes are very 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 uh, sensitive as soon as anything structure or ph changes they become inactive so chlorhexidine takes away this calcium ion and mmps become inactive and when we inhibit them when we uh, make them inactive the degradation of hybrid layer won't occur so how to use this uh, chlorhexidine it's simple once you have done the acid edge just take chlorhexidine in a cotton swab and apply onto the tooth structure for few seconds and then rinse off now i like to point out one thing that we don't want uh, the chlorhexidine that is present in our mouthwash we want pure aqueous chlorhexidine that comes in amber colored bottles coming to the next point we have done the acid edge we have done the rinsing we have applied uh, we have applied our mmp inhibitor that is chlorhexidine now coming to the next part before bonding and we used to learn this right from the dental school dry the tooth structure and not desiccate so what does it mean it means that we want to remove the moisture from enamel surface and we don't want to remove the moisture from dentin and why 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 is that so let's see that schematic diagram once we do acid etching the minerals that were supporting the collagen fiber are, are lost because acid will dissolve the minerals now once those minerals are lost this collagen fibers are somewhat unsupported but they are not collapsed why they are not collapsed because still there is some amount of moisture left and that moisture is kind of helping those collagen fibers to float and swell but let's say if we aggressively dry the tooth what are we doing in 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 drying the tooth aggressively we are removing all that moisture here we are removing all the, all this moisture from the collagen fiber and as soon as that moisture is lost all those collagen fiber will collapse and if they are collapsed obviously the bonding will, won't be proper there will be sensitivity issue there will be bonding issues but if that moisture is maintained i'm not saying it is totally like flooding with water just sufficient amount of moisture is maintained then if you remember our hydrophilic primer ends will easily come in contact with this collagen fibers and entangle with them so that is why we are not excessively drying the dentin and we are trying to um, use caution now yeah again this fibers won't be collapsed because of excessive drying now and there is another point which i like to focus here all of us are using three way syringe but i have noticed and so must have uh, you that you must have also noticed that three way syringe from a single route both water and air is coming so at times when we are blowing air we find some amount of moisture escaping along with the air so using a three way syringe it's uh, quite a uh, delicate matter because when you are trying to dry the tooth sur uh, tooth surface so instead of drying there is some amount of moisture and coming and contaminating our tooth surface just before the bonding so instead of uh, using a three way syringe we can use a chip blower and uh, there is another advantage that uh, it no matter how hard you try to blow with a chip blower you it won't be as aggressive as uh, our three way syringe of the chair furthermore there is no water in this chip blower so we can assume that we are 
blasting it with dry air. I have a video to show you. Uh, yeah, later. Once, okay, carry ahead with the next step. Once we have uh, dried the tooth surface, now there is a question many times, many of us ask in composite restorations that what kind of base or what kind of liner we should use. So first of all, um, majority of the composite restorations, they don't need any kind of liner or base. You can directly go ahead with the composite restoration. But in certain cases, when you think, when you think you are, the remaining dentin thickness is less. Now here, I won't be talking about the direct and indirect pulp capping because it requires an elaborate, it is a uh, big topic and requires special time. So I'll just be mentioning what we should not do and what we should do. So coming to the don'ts, what we shouldn't. So whenever you're, whenever you're planning a composite restoration or when you're planning any kind of bonding, you don't want any kind of zinc oxide eugenol thing because this will interfere in the bonding. You don't want anything related to that. Other thing, you don't need calcium hydroxide. Any calcium hydroxide base is not required on the composite because again, it will it will affect the bonding. So we don't want the ZOE or we don't want any calcium hydroxide thing under composite. What we can use, if let's say, if you, if you think your remaining dentine thickness is less and before going with this primers and adhesive and bonding agent, you can use resin modified GIC. Now there are a lot of the resin modified GIC available in market and just mentioning few names, I don't have any conflict of interest or I don't have any association with those brands, but uh, GC and 3M, they are having this powder and liquid uh, bottle. And this we can use this resin modified GIC over the pulpal floor before going with the composite restoration. This is not very deep restoration, but I don't know. I was, I was maybe I was a bit scared and uh, this is an old case. If, if I was to do this case today, I won't apply any liner, but uh, just, for, just to show you, uh, I have included this picture here. Yeah, there is no base here, but yeah, now I have placed GIC. One thing we need to make sure whenever we applying this liner and bases, we should keep the periphery clean. We don't want any liner or bases on the periphery because our, our main, main restoration will be sealing this area. So if this area is contaminated with whatever the liner and bases you are using, your, your seal and your bonding won't be strong and proper. So you are just, you are just lying on the spot on the purple floor where you are, uh, where, where you think the remaining dentin thickness is less and the rest all periphery should be clean and available for the bonding. If you think your uh, your liner is, is, is flown, you can use a soft spoon excavator or maybe slow speed to again clean this area. Next, coming to good bonding. Now, once the stage is set, we have done our acid etching, we have uh, like clean it, if, if, if any GIC was required, we place the GIC right before the bonding. Right before the bonding, we don't, this is the crucial part because I'll, I'll show you a video here. See what, what we have done because of acid etching, we have created porosities onto the tooth surface. The acid will come in contact with the tooth surface and it will demineralize and dissolve some minerals. And because of dissolving of those minerals, there is porosities created on the tooth surface. Now we have rinsed it, we have dried it. Because of rinsing and drying, because of rinsing and drying, the surface tension or the surface energy here is increased. When I say surface energy is increased, uh, and also you must remember these are micro porosities. So there will be thus this physical uh, laws of physics coming into action that 
there is increased surface energy so this surface is kind of very very receptive for any kind of liquid or moisture as soon as it comes in contact with any moisture whether it be like saliva or water or blood wherever sometimes even after rubber dam isolation uh, the, the saliva from the underneath oozes out and we are not aware so what happens if that saliva comes in contact yeah here the as soon as any kind of liquid here the red is suggesting a uh, red they used red color to suggest blood but it can be saliva it can be water or it can be anything so when you are about to do bonding when you are about to apply a bonding agent this is the most crucial point in your bonding because at this point if there is small amount of contamination it will ruin your bonding so you should be extra careful because all the micro porosities and the roughness that you have created will be occupied by any moisture that will contaminate so make sure before bonding your eyes should be extra focused on the tooth surface another thing bonding now as i said main main focus and the main foundation the main factor that will determine the strength of your restoration is how good the bonding is and how good the bonding is will be all dependent how much your primer is going into the tooth surface all those porosities yeah so when you are applying a bonding agent you should not be stingy i mean take your time when i do when when i apply bonding agent i take at least 15 to 20 seconds and massage on to the tooth tooth surface with my micro brush i take time i properly rub it onto the tooth surface because i want my primer my adhesive if i'm using a single bottle to go into all those nick and crannies which which were created because of acid etching apply it properly massage it then you use your air, uh, three, uh, you use your chip blower to remove all those volatile substances and then apply another coat because let's say if there are any porosities or, or uh, if there are any uh, voids left in your first coat you will apply a second coat which will fill up all the voids so at least at least don't be in a hurry and pay proper attention while doing this step i have noticed one point that for the the people who are not using rubber dam right so they somehow uh, use cotton rolls and suction and uh, uh, retraction and everything they become so much preoccupied trying to isolate the tooth surface that when this stage comes they are so much focused about losing the isolation so they want to apply this bonding agent as much as quickly as possible and light cure it as fast as possible in doing so in doing so there will be many voids which are left onto the uh, onto the tooth surface and your hybrid layer that will be formed will won't be of top notch quality so uh, that is why uh, in a good bonding uh, yeah i think i missed one slide here by mistake number 11 yeah actually this was supposed to be number 11 here first layer first layer is a layer of a flowable composite on the pulpal floor once you have done the bonding once you have cured it the first the first increment or the first thing that will come in contact with the tooth surface will be your a thin layer of flowable composite why we why we want to do that here is a schematic chart that is representing how the c factor decreases and remember the c factor is bonded ratio of bonded surface unbonded surface and the bonded surfaces lower the ratio the better is our restoration because there will be less polymerization shrinkage so when we are applying a thin layer of flowable composite on the pulpal floor 
so try to imagine try to imagine that you are very small and you are sitting inside the tooth cavity and you are sitting on the pulp floor uh, sorry uh, the floor of the cavity when you apply a thin layer of flowable composite you don't want the thin layer of flowable composite to uh, to to, uh, to to bond to the surface let's say buccal or or palatal i'm saying it, it is practically impossible but theoretically you you are trying to minimize the surface area and that is what something they are trying to depict in this the last one where the c factor is shown to be 1.5 so when you apply a very very thin layer of uh, uh, flowable composite onto the floor you are trying to reduce the c factor furthermore because the flowable composite has less fillers and uh, it has the modulus of elasticity it has more flexibility so it will also act as a soft absorbing agent uh, on the pulpal floor now we have we are we are moving ahead into the session just the way we are doing a restoration so we did acid etch we did isolation we did bonding agent right so coming to how do we build up or how we build up our composite restoration so when you are doing a class 1 restoration you uh, this is something called split increment horizontal layering technique for a class 1 and what is that i'll show you a diagram i have this paper and later on i'll be sharing this in the group this was by professor hassan khamis and uh, we'll look at the schematic diagram what he suggests first of all we we apply composite here as you can see in figure 2 first uncure horizontal increment of dentin shade or the composite which you are using for restoration will be placed on the cavity floor then in figure 3 two diagonal cuts split the first uncure increment into the four triangular portion so we are trying to uh, not see if we if we cut it in this diagonal manner what happens is only one surface will be remaining here once that is cured the complete filling of one diagonal cut with another dentin shade of composite followed by photo curing from the occlusal direction so incrementally we are kind of uh, one layer will put one layer and then cure it uh, ultimate main main our main uh, idea is not to just pack the way we do with amalgam because that will increase the c factor we are trying to make uh, diagonals to reduce the c factors this is doctor uh, doctor uh, hasan khamis then there is another technique for class 2 which is modified incremental build up or centripetal build up what we are trying to do is we are trying to convert a class 2 cavity with the help of composite into a class 1 cavity and how the technique was specially developed for uh, class 2 restoration initially a vertical composite increment is applied on the cervical margin against the metal matrix and cavity filling is that completed by horizontal layering i have a case because almost all of us all of us will uh, will be must be following this same technique so after the caries excavation this is the same case which we saw earlier a matrix was adapted yeah so first instead of going from inside to out we are doing centripetal build up that means we are going from out to in why let's say if i add composite here it will be in contact with how many surfaces like one surface two surface three surface right as compared to this one it will be in it will be in contact with only this surfaces so thereby it will also reduce the c factor so we are converting a class 2 into a class 1 and then we are moving inside with horizontal layering this is called a uh, centripetal technique of build up modified it is also called modified incremental filling technique of class 2 composite restoration again the same professor hamis hasan another technique which uh, which i follow more uh, more routinely more often is successive cusp build up technique because whenever we are trying to do a 
aesthetic restoration we want our posterior restoration to look as natural as possible now it is not possible unless and until you build cusp by cusp when you are building cusp by cusp it not only reduces the polymerization shrinkage but it will also give you more control in giving a proper morphology shape to the tooth surface and to the restoration i don't have photos of like cusp by cusp photos because when we are doing a cusp by cusp incremental build up it takes a lot of time so if we if i try to take a snap after each cusp it will increase my procedure time a lot so i don't have any photos to show you incremental build up but this is one of the case which i did with a uh, cusp by cusp build up technique this was a uh, an endodontic tooth and uh, before a patient can get a proper crown i just did a permanent restoration with composite i use cusp by cusp building technique and that is how this tooth was restored now coming to another part heated composite these days like there are two kinds of uh, practitioners those who are very much Uh, uh into this cusp anatomies and biomimetic kind of restoration and then there are certain clinician which they want just functional composite and they are not into all this building cusp and giving a fancy look to your restoration both of them are not wrong and it's just a personal choice but when you when you using heated composite there are less you, you you won't be able to give all those fancy cusp and grooves and tertiary and primary and secondary anatomies but heated composite has an advantage when we think about the functional part what's the advantage of using heated composite let me show you i have this article within the limits of this study it, it's by uh, i think it, it, this article is by dr andrea andrea if i'm not wrong yeah i'll be sharing this article again here yeah. no uh, by dr karim nada heated composite actually increases the mechanical property of your composite the polymerization of a warming composite significantly enhanced the surface hardness it also it it increased the surface hardness and it also enhances the compressive strength so when you're using heated composite you get better mechanical properties you get uh, some more scope of uh, curing depth yeah this is just a stock image from google to show the heated composite one thing i like to point out here when you are using heated composite we we can't uh, uh, use any jugaad kind of thing when you are using heated composite you need a composite warmer you need a composite compule gun because composite heating is not something that you heat cool again that heat again it's not that once the composite that is heated need to be used you can't let it cool down and heat again then you reuse it it will it will in, instead instead of giving a better advantage on the mechanical property if you heat the same composite again and cool down that will be detrimental so take a compule and that is heated and that compule is then used to do the restoration now i i know that not all of us uh, will be having heated composite because one advantage of heated composite is not having any kind of voids so those who are not having any heated composite should use this snow plow technique now this technique was was given by dr johannes optem this is dr johannes optem and uh, what is snow plow technique i'll i'll be showing you. let's say if this was a uh, actually this tooth was again scheduled for endodontic restoration but uh, let's let, let's just assume that we'll be doing a class 2 restoration on this tooth surface so again all the caries was excavated and uh, matrix was adapted now here if i am if i am using a snow plow technique i will apply a thin layer of flowable composite over here a thin layer of flowable composite very thin mind you if you use excess of flowable composite 
that won't help you very thin layer of you let's say one or two drop of fuel composite and without curing without curing that fuel composite you will use your packable composite on to that fuel composite so when you're using when you're putting a small drop fuel composite and over that you're using your packable composite what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, you're trying to adapt the composite on this matrix very very uniformly there will be less chances of void and the composite will be packed homogeneously so snow plow technique is nothing but using both flowable and packable composite together first a small drop of flowable composite and over that packable composite adapt it and then cure again with the next increment again you can do a small drop of flowable and then packable adapt it and cure so that is how we do a snow plow technique and now this is almost routine, routinely used in all the composite restoration coming to another tip which is my uh, uh, my personal advice which i have uh, in my limited experience which i believe is minimalist approach in composite restoration what is minimalist approach that means uh, less is more when you are using tints when you are using instruments when you are trying to adapt the composite in my opinion a micro brush and an explorer are just sufficient to do a restoration i am not saying that all the different shapes of the composite restoration that are available in market are useless i'm not saying they are not they are useless i'm just saying that those in instruments which are kind of overpriced and the utility utility is not as much as the price that means if if, if let's say if i have just an explorer and a micro brush i will be I, i will be able to do this composite restoration like decently satisfactorily right i'm not i'm not saying that i'll be able to uh, do all those tertiary anatomies but yes functionally i will be able to do a decent amount of restoration so minimum inventory right we don't want like seven to eight different shapes of instruments two or three different types of composite brush furthermore uh, let's say if you do if you're trying to do a biomimetic restoration right when you're doing increment minimal increment minimalist approach if you take small amount of increment and adapt it it will be adapted to the shape very easily but let's say if you take a big increment and try to give shape you will be you will be instead of giving proper shape you will have more chances of meeting making mistakes your cusp will be uh, uh, kind of skewed one cusp may appear large one cusp may appear small and all sorts of problem may occur Furthermore, let's say if you're let's say if you're doing a anterior restoration and if you are taking like big chunks of composite rest composite material and trying to adapt it, right? So you will need more strokes of your micro brush or whatever instrument you are using. So each stroke, each stroke, no matter how gently you use, it will leave a mark on to the composite surface. And when you cure it, that mark will be uh, set. on to the tooth surface so you will be spending more time finishing trying to smoothen all those marks because you have already created while adapting the composite so minimalist approach try to use minimal stroke to adapt the composite try to use minimal small amount of increment try to use minimal inventory and when we when it comes to stains as you can see in this restoration i have used stains right your stain when we are using stain the uh, the idea behind using stain is to give a natural look right we are not trying to give a careless look or artificial look so be judicious judicious with your stains and use as less as possible uh, dr wahid coming g sorry you have 15 more minutes yeah yeah we uh, just yeah, we are just uh, almost nearing the end just right. two more this is tip number 18 so i think we have till tip 20 brilliant brilliant thank you so uh, coming to the proper curing thing now uh, my personal experience with the curing is yeah, try to use a good quality curing light but let's say let's say because of financial reasons and if you are not able to get a proper good branded quality light then the next best i'll be i'll suggest is a light which has a cord 
I won't suggest cordless curing light because with the cordless, sometimes the, the charge in your the, the charge, the battery that are charged in cordless, maybe the, it is not fully charged and that will affect the intensity of, uh, it, it will be very dim in light. When you have a cord, cord light, there is uniform power supply and it will be much better. And uh, another point that I would like to draw here, uh, draw the attention that many, many composite companies, especially the bulk fill composite companies, they, they try to claim that you can cure up to four millimeter, you can cure up to more than four millimeters. But uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a topic of debate and confusion. I tried to ask seniors, I, I tried to read uh, papers and even on online, like as much as I tried, I didn't come to a, a substantial conclusion that, okay, fine, you can cure up to four millimeters or five millimeters. It was still debatable. So personally, I suggest no matter what composite you're using, never try to cure more than two to three millimeter at a time, right? They may claim up to four millimeter, but it is better to be safe than sorry and try to use smaller increments. Again, our minimalist approach not to be uh, brave and try to go, uh, go along with the claims of the companies and try to cure big chunks of composite. Coming to oxygen inhibition layer. What is oxygen inhibition layer? The topmost surface of the composite or the reason that you are curing comes in contact with uh, oxygen and it is not cured properly. Now why this oxygen inhibition layer is important? Let's say if it is not cured properly, in the next coming slide I have a photo which will give you an exaggerated, exaggerated example what it can do. Here there is a picture of a candle. As you can see, the surface of the candle is very soft and no amount of sandpaper or the abrasive disc will give you a good polish. So when your composite surface is not cured properly, that is, it is not cured with oxygen inhibition. That means just before curing, you have not placed any gel or any liquid to prevent oxygen, prevent the formation of oxygen inhibition layer. So what will happen is that topmost surface will not be cured. It won't be strong. It won't be tough. And if it is not tough and if it's not strong, you won't be able to polish it. And if it is not polished, it will be discolored easily. So here is a picture and this, this, uh, this particular oxygen inhibition layer is more relevant or, uh, it becomes more important when you are doing posterior bonded restorations because when you're doing a direct composite restoration, okay, fine. We can see that occlusal part or the topmost part is not cured properly. Maybe it is not strong, but when you do proper polishing, right? Some finishing and polishing, you will be able to remove that some amount of uh, topmost layer and get kind of decent polish. But when you're doing a posterior bonded restoration, it, the composite that is present, it is very thin right at, at the interface of the tooth and the prosthesis it's very thin right so you don't have much scope to remove that and coming to our last and final tip that is proper polishing your composite restoration needs proper polishing if it is not properly polished it won't fail immediately but you're you're ultimately reducing the life of your restoration and obviously, uh, who doesn't want, who doesn't like shiny polished surfaces? Uh, I have a case here. This patient came to me with, uh, he had this crown on the adjacent tooth and he wanted something to be done for this uh, incisor for aesthetic reasons. And uh, this was an unscheduled appointment. So, uh, so we tried to do as, as much as possible. I used a single shade and I was I not able to... Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, you have a red and a yellow line on your screen. Is that your... I, I, I don't know how it came, but... Uh, anyway, uh, that's okay. Uh, let's carry on. Yeah. Because I I'm think, is, it, is it okay? Yeah, now it's better. Yeah, yeah. Better. Yeah. Please, yeah. you can carry on now. Yeah. So, uh, we had this incisor and patient wanted something aesthetic restoration. So we tried to do an aesthetic restoration as uh, within the uh, limits of my 
my my abilities i was not able to get the opacity right at this incisal edge but again i think that red line came yeah okay fine so patient was happy and patient was happy with the result because of the polishing and how do we get this proper polished surface it's simple and uh, step wise what i use what i use is uh, first of all we will we will be doing finishing of the composite restoration before going ahead with the polishing so either we can go ahead with a red grit slow speed burr or uh, if you if you are confident enough with your high speed you can do gross finishing with a red grit burr once that gross finishing is done you there will be marks because of this red grit burr there will be marks present abrasive on your surface you need to soften all those uh, marks and abrasives on the on the composite restoration with polishing kit you can use any 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 rubber points rubber cups there are different available in the market you can use any uh, the speed here the speed here is around 10000 to 12000 rpm and preferably when you uh, use this rubber cups along with water right so the heat generated will be will be dissipated because of use of water so use this rubber cups to remove and soften all those marks which were on the composite restoration because of finishing once that is done then uh, again i would like to mention there is no conflict of interest with any company it is just that i don't i have not used any lot of materials different materials and this is what i use in the case uh, which i showed in the previous picture here in this case i used this diashine diashine uh, goat hair brush diashine kamua leather and the diashine polishing paste to do the to the polishing of the restoration so first we take a small amount of diamond paste along with the goat hair and here we won't be using water we will be using just diashine polishing paste and the goat hair brush and we will be trying to uh, we will try to polish it dry without any water once goat hair brush is done we'll follow uh, we, we will follow it with uh, kamua chamua leather and then above so that is how uh, i i managed to get this finished and polished surface why and uh, sorry with that we will why? end no no sorry just a moment you need to deactivate your whiteboard i think that's why you have those red and yellow lines mm, let me check it's probably your cursor yeah i think this was on probably okay right sorry i i i interrupted your conclusion you could yeah, finish yeah. it off yeah. okay fine so this was all and uh, i i know there will be a lot of things which i might have missed out but uh, given the time constraint i try to compile just in the manner we approach our restoration and uh, thank you for being a patient audience i'll try to get back with the articles which i mentioned in uh, in the presentation i'll be try i'll i'll be i'll try to share them in the group so that you can go through the article and read completely how and what it's mentioned so i think we'll conclude here thank you dr wahid um, thank you thank you everyone well thank you everyone for listening to the talk we have uh, our panels here uh, i'd like to introduce uh, well you 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 know the speaker we have dr shiraz uh, who is one of our panel members and dr iftikhar and i'm also going to uh, have a special special guest today dr brar ahmed is also with us and he's going to be one of the panel members as well uh-huh uh, um dr wahid you can stop sharing your screen now if that's okay yeah. right i'm unable to find dr if we have got dr if sikhar so i'm going to unmute just the panel members
Can we start the question and answer session, please? Just a moment. I'm just looking for. Oh yeah, you got it, Sahab. There. Okay, fine. So I'm just unmuting the. I'm going to unmute Abrar as well. So there you go. Just a moment. I don't know. I think yeah, right. Okay, we've got some questions. Uh, Nadim, would you want to take a take over? Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. Go the yeah. go on. To I'll, I'll go ahead with the first question. I'll go ahead with the first question. It's by Dr. Nadim. How do you control the GCF in class five cavity? I would repeat. How do you control the GCF in class five cavity? Gingival fluid. Gingival yeah. trabecular fluid. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's. I think it's better if I share because I have a photo of isolation of gingival trabecular fluid in the first in the first picture when which I shared about isolation. It was about gingival trabecular fluid. So I will share that image again. and uh, i also have a image with uh, sometimes which i use along with teflon and a retraction pod so i will share that image in the group to please, please. show Sh shall i share now or after the yeah yeah you can share it, share it now you share you can share it now okay you can share your screen again that's fine yeah actually that particular image in me is some other folder so i'm just uh, i think no problem i think the images can be shared later on on the group probably yeah can... yeah yeah that's what i'm saying i i yeah. if it is any uh, i i yeah just go ahead with the next query i'll be sharing that image in the group fine the, the next question is uh, is by dr ghazala Her question is: What is the percentage of chlorohexidine used? Two to four percent. Pure aqueous chlorohexidine, two to four percent is uh, enough for uh, mm. Uh, you mean to say the two percent would act same as the four percent, or will it change the uh, treatment outcome? It won't. It won't significantly alter the treatment outcome. You can use the either one. Fine. Thank you. I have next question from Dr. Gausia. Her question is: What does enamel deproteinization means during etchant use, and is there any any difference between enamel etching and denting etching exist? Nadim, can Do I just interrupt? Sorry. Nadim, can I just interrupt? Sorry, you missed one question there. Uh, during the repair of composites, this is from Dr. Gausia. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. During uh, the repair, repair of composites. do you follow the same protocol uh, for example she's asked whether it's uh, the etching time bonding time if you're repairing composites repairing uh, repairing composite i mean uh, will will you be able to i mean uh, can i get some elaboration about it I, okay i, I i'll just share what what i personally do let's say if i if i have a uh, anterior restoration let's say incisor which i did let's say i i did a diastema closure and that patient comes again after some time with some chip off so what i'll try to do is obviously that composite restoration is was subjected to the oral cavity it will be having a uh, plaque and it will be having food debris so i'll try to remove some amount of uh, composite with my burr before going ahead with the restoration now whether we want to etch the composite no we don't need etching the composite we can directly go ahead with the bonding but if just if just i personally use this technique to differentiate let's say if it is very difficult to differentiate between the composite and the food surface because of color i'll apply uh, acid etch for let's say for 2 to 5 seconds and then rinse off and then dry this rinsing will demarcate the enamel and the composite and it will prevent us from removing excess of enamel when we are doing a repair of the composite once that is done i'll just go ahead with my bonding agent and the composite curing for repair brilliant uh nadim you can continue sorry yeah the next question is uh, by dr gausia begum i would like dr abra to answer this dr abra are you online yeah tell me ma'am yeah the question is what does enamel deproteinization means during etching or is there any difference between enamel etching and dentin etching does it exist or do we etch dentin at all hello can you hear me now yeah yeah 
I mean, you got the question. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me again. Yeah. Yeah, I would repeat the question. What does enamel? I would, I will, I'll split the question into three parts so that you can answer in three parts. What does enamel deprotonization means during etching? Yeah. And is there any difference between enamel etching and dentin etching? Does it exist or do we etch dentin at all? I mean, technically, when once clinically, when you're doing a procedure, it's always very difficult to differentiate between enamel and dentin. So, I mean, the way you look at one technique, what uh, Dr. Wahid has mentioned, is uh, perhaps longer etching for the enamel and less for the dentin. I mean, the, no, at the moment, the market, there are so many products. Now. I always tend to stick by the manufacturers as a first uh, uh, priority. Now, if I'm etching, I wouldn't go more than, say, 20 seconds, perhaps, unless the manufacturer mentions longer. Now, coming back to the dentine, yes, we always, the dentine etching is always minimal in compared to the enamel. Hello? Yeah, 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 yeah please yeah, continue, yeah. Dr. Brad, continue. So I think what Dr. Wahid mentioned about, uh, you know, longer time for the enamel and the dentine, that's, I think that's a good tip to take forward. Now, is there any major difference in terms of uh, uh, deep protonization? Uh, well, uh, there are some papers which, which say that, you know, using sodium hypochlorite prior to acid etching could also be used to increase the surface area of adhesion of composite. Uh, but I personally haven't tried that. Uh, so hence, I hope that answers the question now. Right. Dr. Shiraz, do you uh, want to I, add anything on this, please? Yeah, yeah. I would like to add. Uh, basically, enamel deproteinization is nothing but we remove an organic layer of... Uh, uh, organic layer from the enamel surface before etching. So we use, uh, like uh, Dr. Abrar said, we use hypo, uh, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, what it does, uh, when we are going to etch the enamel, uh, there are actually three types of etching patterns which happen in the enamel, that is type 1, type 2, type 3. In uh, type 1, we, uh, we, the, only the enamel rods are etched. And in type 2, the uh, inter, uh, inter enamel rods uh, are etched, that is the interprismatic enamel is etched. Uh, in type three, the uh, in in type three, you have uh, both the combination of uh, these two. So when we want uh, we want an ideal scenario would be a, uh, you know type three, or uh, uh, you know we want to remove the organic debris and then go ahead with the acid etching. Uh, there are some reports which say that it will increase the retention. Uh, like uh, even I have uh, haven't personally tried it uh, using uh, sodium hypochlorite uh, before etching. Uh, uh, but would, that's what the i would like Hello? to speak something about this one uh, i think two or three years back uh, i had come across this piece of uh, thing article about using hypochlorite to, to clean the tooth surface before going for acid agent bonding but then uh, again at that time i thought chlorhexidine and hypochlorite they don't mix math much they they do precipitate and uh, if i was go, if i was if i was to use uh, chlorhexidine so I, I i stopped using hypochlorite to clean the tooth surface and also i had this particular doubt in my mind that all these organic debris if uh, if you are using excavation procedures right so they will be removed along with the burr or the sand blasting or maybe the ab abrasive agents like pumice so, I think uh, I think in cases like uh, we are doing dash in closure, we don't where we don't use uh, much of uh, rotary. Yeah, uh, rotary. yeah. yeah. That, in such that, cases, that, uh, we can. Uh, we, uh, I mentioned that uh, abrasive strips for. Uh, yes. In such right. cases, probably we can uh, try it out. But because of this chlorhexidine, I stopped using hypochlorite because I was afraid of getting stains on food surface. Right. Thank you. The next question is uh, by Dr. Aisha Taha. Uh, her query is, uh, can we use uh, any type of liners or bases under composite? Any specific type of liners or bases? Uh, as I mentioned, that only and only resin modified GIC, if, if, at all, if at all it is needed, if at all we think the uh, remaining dentine thickness is less, resin modified GIC is best indication and uh, anything else is not required. But uh, we are not talking about direct pulp capping and indirect pulp capping because again, in that one, we, before using a resin modified GIC, 
when it comes to direct or indirect or tapping, we will be using MTA or biodentin followed by resin modified GIC and composite. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, just to uh, I would the... like to add. I would like to add in that. Yeah. Uh, when you see, uh, commonly the general practitioners, what they do, they use uh, either a type 2 GIC or a type 1 GIC as a lineup. Uh, usually these are water-based uh, cements. It, uh, the liquid contains a lot of water. So it takes around uh, 24 hours for it to get uh, set and then only you can etch it. So it is ideally not recommended for us to use type 1 or type 2 GIC. There is only one base which can be used, like uh, Dr. Wahid said, it is only resin modified GAC under composite. You have to use resin modified GAC under composite in all conditions. There is no second thought about it. Right. Uh, there's one query which went unanswered actually during the question time. Do we etch dentine at all, Dr. Shiraz? Yes, we do etch dentine just to remove a little bit of smear layer and uh, just to, but the etching time has to be very less. Or we, if you are using a sixth generation bonding agent where we have a uh, acid primer uh, that will take care of the uh, smear layer which which we want to remove it, or we, if you want to modify the smear layer. Okay, I think the but next the etching question. Time, etching time has to be very limited, say five to six seconds. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the next question is for Dr. Iftakar. Uh, is there any study or li literature supporting uh, the age difference of the etching time? Uh, you mean to say, as uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid said, if there is a patient who is older yeah. because of the sclerosis of the dentine, uh, for example, is... if it's a case scenario, for example, is the etching would be same for a six-year-old and a sixty-year-old? Will it be same? See, if you're talking about a six-year-old, if you're talking about a permanent tooth, yeah, uh, I mean generally you get. Uh, if you're talking about a deciduous and a permanent, then it's a different thing. This is, totally, let let us keep talking, it for a permanent tooth, say yeah. a molar for a seven, eight year old uh, kid yes, and a six year old patient. Is the etching would be the same time? That's what, as uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid uh, mentioned, yeah. there are studies where yeah. there will be more of sclerosis in the sense more of tertiary dentine formation as you age. So, there are, uh, uh, you may have to etch a little bit more, but uh, I don't think so. There's much of significance uh, in that because. Uh, the technique, what he said, uh, well, see what we are, what he was talking about, this total etch technique. Uh, actually, uh, we are doing selective etching. We are etching the enamel first, okay, and then we are etching the dentine. As even Shira said, for dentine, we we just need probably five to ten seconds, and enamel we pro we need we may have to go up to thirty seconds. And I, I would suggest ra rather than the way of Abdul Wahid, I mean that's his uh, way of doing it, but. What I uh, generally do is I place the etchant around in, on the enamel at, in one time rather than slowly doing it. Wait for some time, maybe a 10 seconds and 20 seconds, then etch the dentine and then rinse. So uh, I, uh, I don't think so. There's much of difference of, uh, between uh, too much of sclerotic uh, tooth and this. But yes, there are studies which say that a little bit of more etching is required. Uh, I would like to add one point which I missed while, uh, while uh, during my session session that uh, whenever we are doing acid edge, uh, it was my ex earlier experience that bad quality acid edge were such that we don't stay at one place. Whenever we have a poor quality acid edge, they don't stay at one place and we, as soon as we put them and they will be flow, they will be flowing all over to the tooth surface. So preferably use an acid edge which stays on to the tooth surface which we have placed and not flow here and there. Uh, just to add, actually, uh, this is this is my query, Dr. Iftakar. Yeah. Uh, when you say the amount of quantity of the etchant, see, uh, basically there are two ways the etchant is dispensed, either in the syringe form or in the bottle form. So a syringe form, uh, you can directly put it onto the tooth. Particularly the bottle one, you try to take it on a uh, on a uh, on a on a slab on a brush what, or what something, say, a mixing slab or something. Applicate a brush. Uh -huh. Yeah, the quantity of etchant which is poured onto the enamel or dent dentine that that alter see sometimes the quantity is in the same uh, when you when you put the etchant the part of the etchant is quite thick some part of the etchant is quite you know uh, very liquid particularly the bottle part i have observed the syringe is quite uniform throughout the syringe is very much uniform the bottle is quite you know the, the part is quite I, thick I, consistency I, I, 
you you got my point what i'm I, i got to... it i got it yeah. See, it's, it's been long time since i've used this bottle uh, uh, it's in you know yeah. probably during a post graduation time i've okay. always been using now gel uh, the syringe one and the consistency of these gels uh, syringe gels are very uh, you know uniform yeah so i generally don't get any problem with the gel as you said bottle it's been I, I, i hardly use them actually Uh, Dr. Wahid, uh, do you use the bottle form or the syringe forms, uh, Dr. Wahid? I use syringe form. Right. So you mean to say bottles should not be used? Uh, no, no. I didn't mean bottles should be used. I haven't used. In fact, I have never used a bottle uh, uh, HN. So I have no experience with the bottle one. See the whole idea of I have, having I have this. Used, uh, I have used both, uh, Dr. Nadim. I have used both. Yeah, like you said, uh, the consistency of uh, bottle is uh, it's uh, the viscosity is very very uh, less. It is uh, too liquidy the bottle, so it uh, you cannot have the control of the flow in a bottled uh, etchant. So preferably uh, we should use a etchant which is uh, in the syringe. I don't know why. Uh, maybe I have seen a lot of orthodontists using uh, the bottled uh, etchant. Maybe because of the quantity, but. Uh, i preferably uh, don't like the bottled one because of the because it flows a lot so it's basically between the liquid and the gel gel has control no. on the flow yes uh, yeah no so they say that's why even the, the bottled is one better. is a gel bottled one also is a gel but the flow is more in uh, exactly in, exactly i think that uh, is to do with the room temperature basically i think hn needs to be refrigerated i don't think so not required As composites, to, as, as composites are refrigerated, do an etchants need to be refrigerated? No need, is it? No need, no need. Not necessary. Fine. Can I, can I, I have, I have the next question. I have the next question from. Sorry. One more. Uh, for the sake of clarity, can I just ask a question to Dr. Thakar? Uh, when he said we have to etch it a little more, are you talking in terms of the duration of the entire etching, etching process or the quantity of the etchant? There is nothing to do with duration. the quantity. Whatever is. yeah it's just the duration because quantity there should be enough quantity to uh, wet the dentin or enamel so you use more or less it's going to be the same it's it should be adequate enough it's the duration uh, basically actually as uh, dr shiraz had mentioned there's difference in etching patterns of enamel and dentin as he mentioned the three types of uh, etching patterns of enamel and dentin is basically is the modification of the smear layer that is more important like they are actually more schools of thought about complete removal of smear layer or not and th- that's a, another different thing actually in dentin we are talking about the dentinal uh, tubules and interradicular dentin you know the dent- intertubular dentin that's why yeah intertubular dentin sorry so uh, th- th- it's a much more thing than you know uh, right right yeah. thanks dr iftakar i think the next question is by dr aisha taha again uh dr wahid you have already answered this you have to just uh, just put some more uh, light on this you mentioned about applying of chlorhexidine can you please be more specific how long it should be applied for uh i i i generally do like 20 15 to 20 second of scrubs and that is in more than enough and i'll just rinse off uh, so you mean to say the percentage of chlorhexidine depends upon your number of scrubs no 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 either either way whether you're using 2% or the 4% works fine and uh, what we say 20, 15 to 20 seconds are like enough another thing is that uh, as a composite restoration is uh, you there are many steps involved right so uh, we let's say if someone is doing a scrub thing we we are not in a position to a certain that how many seconds are affecting let's say i i scrub my composite uh, my tooth surface for this many second and that is why my restoration was the life of the restoration was like elongated furthermore because a lot of steps are involved we cannot a certain we are just trying to uh, do every little bit to ultimately cumulative cumulative effect will be a better restoration so it's not so uh, tech what we say relevant factor that how many seconds and how we are doing it as long as you are doing it for few seconds it will be good right dr wahid thank you there's one question you missed out uh, this no. is from doc, dr tabassum can we use an ultra ultrasonic scaler if we don't have sandblasting uh, to remove the plaque or remove you know i think 
it depends on the surface because uh, if you are if, if you are speaking about interproximal surface and the tip doesn't reach the interproximal surface maybe it won't be enough but if a ultrasonic is diamond coated and maybe if they are let's say uh, after immediate dentin sealing if you are doing on gingival sheet and if it is able to remove some amount of plaque and the tooth structure maybe we can but uh, it's it, it's not a yes blanket yes or a direct no it depends on the situation okay right and uh, the next question is from asmat jahan she says how do we do ceramic repair with composites again ceramic repair with composites is a different thing because we need something uh, a coupling agent that will that will create the here on tooth surface the primer is acting as a bridge between the tooth substrate and our composite right this primer which is used for tooth won't be good enough for using on a ceramic right we need another monomers which will be able to create a proper bond with the tooth uh, with the ceramic surface and then our the composite so the, whichever the ceramic uh, repairing kit they are using they should follow the manufacturer instruction and use indicated monomer and silence for repair excellent dr wyd uh, i have next uh, question yeah, actually Dr. i would want to add something one minute yeah, please, uh, please please yeah, please see, do so. the thing is with ceramic repair you can't etch it with the regular uh, orthophosphoric acid yes, you yes. have to correct uh, use uh, hydrofluoric acid yeah okay and as as dr abdul wahid mentioned you have to also seal in the area as only then there'll be coupling between uh, your bonding agent and uh, the thing so uh, there uh, some people i have seen they try to etch it with the hydro regular hydrofluoric acid it can't be done you need special uh, hydrofluoric acid and the silane silane only then you can do it thank you dr iftakar the next question is by dr rashika tabassum uh, to dr abrar ahmed uh, can we use ultrasonic scalers uh, to remove plaque if not if sand blasting uh, 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 technique is not was there asked, sand blasting uh, this was asked before just was it was it yeah, answered actually back to us i just asked oh sorry sorry answered. i lost it i, I lost it i'm sorry no, was, the, only, the only thing i would add yeah. is uh, obviously uh, plaque is not like tartar i mean you okay. don't want you don't want to use anything too too abrasive or aggressive to remove the plaque because you land up sort of you land up sort of uh, intervening with enamel what i what, what i tend to do is good prophylaxis first to get rid of all the tartar and good polishing and then it's all ready for the composite to be done and the one observation which i've uh, in fact i've made which i would like to ask abdul wahid uh, is uh, that you've mentioned about using those strips mechanical strips to uh, for the interproximal area to remove the plaque uh, that's i mean obviously you've got to be really careful with that while 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 using them because instead of plaque there's a, there's a high chance that you potentially could uh, uh, get rid of the enamel i mean what are your, what are your, what are your thoughts about that bill wahid hello yeah. i agree i agree we should be very much cautious using those because uh, uh inadvertently or accidentally we may end up removing excess of tooth structure interproximally actually the strip which you showed in the picture are used to remove uh, stains the interdental stains which are uh, present which cannot be removed with ultrasonic scanning those uh, strips are meant for that right but can i can i, I get the next question going please yeah uh, dr abrar can we have your video if you don't mind yeah yeah the next question is uh, it's from dr adib uh, he asks uh, maximum thickness of gic permissible while doing sandwich technique sorry nadim did you go to the other question ceramic repair with composites yeah that we finished okay maximum thickness of gic permissible when doing sandwich technique i think uh, dr uh, wahid can take this uh, i would say one less than 1 mm 1 mm will be enough and again it it all depends uh, can i can the, i add yes yeah it, it it all depends on the depth of the cavity uh, ideally we can have at yes. least uh, 2 mm of composite we we should have at least 2 mm of composite uh, for the normal wear and then uh, uh, if the cavity depth is say around uh, 5 mm 
we can have 3 mm of uh, resin modified gic to reduce the polymerization shrinkage so uh, because uh, resin modified gic is the best replacement for uh, denting uh, sorry can i interrupt bio can i can i interrupt uh, i know we are yeah, talking yes, uh, we are talking a lot about liners and bases here um, would you prefer more tooth tooth structure for bonding to take place so that you limit the thickness of uh, your gic and the purpose of bases here is only to protect it acts like a protection over the pulp or over the liner whatever you placed so how would you actually specifically say 3 mm or 4 mm because you are meant to keep the base as thin as possible if i'm not wrong no there is a difference between a base and a uh, liner uh, if you are using a liner then you keep it as thin as possible but if you are using it as a base then you keep it at least 1.5 mm or uh, more or less because uh, why i'll tell you because the like you said the function of base is yes definitely protection of the pulp but the bonding uh, happens from the circumferential bonding of the enamel so we are uh, we we have adequate amount of two structure from the buccal labial if you are talking of a class 1 cavity we have adequate amount of two structure because we are applying base only on the pulpal floor so just to uh, overcome the polymerization shrinkage we can keep it uh, you know you can have a uh, thickness of composite look at the thickness of the composite at least uh, 2 mm of composite is enough for occlusal loading and rest you can uh, re replace it with the base that's my uh, idea of doing it right thank you dr shiraz uh, can we have dr gausia begum on online please uh, can, can, i would like her to ask the question directly Dr. Rosia, let, let me unmute her. Dr. Rosia, can you speak, please? Dr. Rosia, yeah, hello, yeah, Dr. Rosia. I've got my answer, sir. Yeah, because your next question was for twenty yes, years yes. versus six years. Yes, there was a confusion that you know, for primary teeth and from like I think six years in. So I wanted to ask about twenty years versus forty years, like. But Dr. Eftakhar was I I got the answer from him, sir. Actually, yeah, because right. Nadim had made it uh, clear yes. this is a permanent tooth. So. Yes. Right. yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the next question is by Dr. Hilal. Uh, what is the life of composite restoration? <laughs> I think this is the most common question asked by every patient. What What is, is the, he asking? Is, is he asking the as the life of filling? Is he asking as a patient or a doctor? <laughs> Dr. Hilal, <laughs> no, I don't know. You are a patient <laughs> or a doctor? Okay, fine. Can you uh, can I don't know anybody yeah, I, can take this uh, question. I oh, well think done, uh, the senior most uh, will be better be able to answer because they they have more experience. Yeah, I have a composite in my mouth, which was done in two thousand eight, which is a class two. I have a composite uh, which was done by my professor, which was done uh, in two thousand eight. It is still lasting. There is no problem, no uh, post operative sensitivity. So you can say twelve years it has lasted. So oh, that's, nice. that's nice. That's nice. Okay. Uh, can we use SDF before bonding? By Dr. Aisha. Could you elaborate what SDF is, please, for the uh, for the rest? Fluoride, I guess. Silver, silver diamine fluoride. Yeah, yeah. Silver diamine fluoride. Yes. I think uh, this question can be answered by Dr. Gausia better. Uh, Dr. Gausia, you can take the liberty to answer. please i i think you need to unmute her i'm trying she can mute unmute on from her side is it arsal yeah yeah, yeah dr can you can unmute her. yourself please i missed the question sir yeah can we use silver diamine fluoride before bonding sdf silver. before bonding um, um. i haven't used it so and in first place i never recommend using silver diamine fluoride i don't know what is the advantage of uh, its use in first place because it has its staining capacity so i always prevent uh, its use yeah correct dr abra your views on sdf no i don't use personally nothing i haven't used okay, it fine. fine 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 so i think the next question is from dr parvez he is asking uh, can we use 10% polyacrylic acid as dentin conditioner instead of dentin etching uh, can dr iftakhar take this question please 
See, that's what, uh, as we were discussing about uh, dentin uh, etching or conditioning, uh, generally we refer conditioning if you are going for glass fine number cements, uh, what we were talking about uh, the conventional types and etching for composites. But uh, gen uh, we always use 37% uh, uh, polyacrylic acid or for even orthophosphoric acid. Orthophosphoric acid. So uh, I uh, I don't know about this 10 percent uh, using uh, for composites. Never used it. I don't have any literature also supporting it. So it's basically 37 percent. Only thing is the etching time differs. So effect, uh, efficiently 37 percent uh, would be able to modify the smear layer. Uh, that's what the study says. Any other panelists would like to add on on this question, please? Fine. I would go ahead with the next question is Dr. Uh, by Dr. Ghazala is uh, directed towards Dr. Wahid. When we refrigerate composites and bonding agents, do we need to bring it to the room temperature prior to use? Uh, usually, yes, I, I do that. But I think by the time you arrange everything and do it, it does come to the room temperature. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's not by so default, significant. Yeah, significant. By the time yeah. we do it anyway, uh, and also, we compose it is so so much used in clinic that it, I I don't think that after finishing one patient, we are placing back to the refrigerator and the temperature goes down and the next patient is. It's in, technically it's at the room temperature because after one patient and another patient it is like in, in the clinic. The question is, uh, at what temperature should we refrigerate refrigerate the composites to for their longevity of their uh, material basically? I, I I don't have a specific. Uh, uh, I haven't come across any specific temperature so as to say that this is the thing that is to be. Uh, m mostly, I I would say that better to go along with the manufacturer's instruction. They will mention it whether it is to be refrigerated or uh, or to be kept at room temperature. Uh, Dr. Do you want to add? Do do you do you want to add something on this? Dr. Abrar. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Time again? Uh, I think uh, time for black coffee, Abrar. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I was just talking about you know refrigeration of composites and bonding agents, yeah. and uh, should we bring that to room temperature uh, room temperature before using it? So, what's your take on this? I mean, ideally, yes. I mean, it has to be at least to the room temperature. If you know, if someone's not using a heated composite, the minimal you what you expected is to have it to the room temperature. I mean, as rightly Dr. Wahid, he uh, mentioned that by the time you arrange everything, it's already there. And, I think uh, that a country like UK, you don't need a refrigerator, right? Yeah. I was just going to tell most, that. <laughs> mostly, yeah. Oh, you have the radiator right next to you. Just leave it on that. <laughs> it depends um, on the place. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I, have, I have a question from uh, Dr. Khurath. I think it's a very long question. Dr. Khurath, can you come? Uh, can you unmute yourself and ask the question directly, please? That would be much better. Dr. Khurat. Doctor, yeah. Uh, my question was uh, like in the presentation, it was mentioned uh, that uh, we detect dyes. I mean, we use uh, dyes to detect the plaque, uh, especially for any aesthetic restorations like midline diastema. So, if there is any pre-existing restoration. Uh, don't you think that the dye will uh, stain that? And uh, what if it stains, then what are the other methods which can be used to detect the plaque? Any of the panelists can take the question, please. I think, see, uh, if a plaque disclosing agent dyes something, it is suggestive of plaque present. And if the plaque is present, we are trying, we will be obviously uh, doing something on that surface, whether it is casting or abrasive or uh, or using a burr or anything. Regarding the pre-existing restoration, whenever we are doing it, uh, let's say if it is there is already some amount of previously, let's say we are doing a diastema closure second time, I would personally prefer to remove the previous restoration than doing or building up building upon the previous composite. The other building upon the previous composite, it's better to remove and then go ahead with the new restoration. Hope that answers your query, Dr. Forath. 
sir then what are the other uh, disclosing agents we can use sir like we have the very old uh, you know uh, dyes uh, i think like erythrocin uh, erythrocin red uh, erythrocin has <laughs> one there is disclosing tone anything else sir, we can use apart from that sir uh, to to uh, check the plaque Yes, sir. Other than dyes, no, I don't think uh, we don't, we have anything which will be a visual visual guidance to check for the plaque. Other than dyes. Okay. Doctor Shiraz, uh, anything new in the textbooks regarding dyes? Any latest addition? No, no. I think erythrocin red has been used uh, from a long time. That can yes. be used as a plaque plaque disclosing disclosing agent. And your question on uh, oxygen inhibited layer, Doctor Kurad. Yes, I think you yourself can answer that. Oh no! No, I just wanted to know, sir. Like uh, normally, like whenever we are curing, so obviously there will be some amount of uh, unpolymerized resin on the surface because of uh, the interchange which happens with the oxygen in the environment. So that's how the oxygen inhibition layer is formed. But my question is, sir, like how can we prevent it? And also, like uh, normally for this inlays and all, we use this indirect composites. so can we use it for like class 1 class 2 like since we are using uh, indirect composites for inlays and all so i just wanted to know so like can we use it for uh, class 1s and class 2s also like that's what i want to know actually so. i think your question is how do you prevent uh, uh, first thing is yes sir how to prevent it and uh, uh, normally what we use is there something called as indirect composites sir so this uh, like it will prevent the formation of this oxygen inhibition layer like how is like like sir said that we can preheat the composite that's one way to prevent the polymerization shrinkage and also in this what we do is we use a nitrogen atmosphere sir so that you know when we are curing uh, the uh, composite in this nitrogen atmosphere it will prevent the interference of the oxygen which is present in the environment and prevent the formation of this oxygen inhibition so that's one way uh, so that's why we use normally this indirect composites for inlays sir. direct or indirect inlays so I think my clinically i think clinically i think glycerin is, glycerin is used to prevent uh, oxygen in inhibition layer yes, yes sir. they say that yeah we can use glycerin in yeah, way no dr abdul why that shown a gel what is that glycerin or some other gel what any 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 water based gel the only intention is to prevent the oxygen from coming in contact and what, what do you use what what do you use if, uh, there is a jo johnson and johnson has a uh, water based jelly gel ky gel you yeah you can just pick ky jelly from the shop also i i think some uh, they, some people even use uh, anesthetic gels yeah lignocaine translucent enough to allow the light to pass through there was a question about these uh, plaque and all that and uh, if in case you're trying to see for initial caries uh, how about this transillumination do you try uh, you know using transillumination we can use no because uh, uh, abdul wahid was asked uh, talking about the dyes and as khurat uh, mentioned dyes could uh, you know see. take up uh, the composite pre existing composite can take up the stain so probably a transillumination could be a, another solution for it okay. right fine uh, the next question is from dr asmat uh, i think this question was already answered by dr iftagar i think you can just add on dr iftagar acid etching on fluorosis teeth acid etching on fluorosis teeth yeah fluorosis teeth fluorosis teeth yeah so again i think if i'm not wrong you need to etch more in uh, teeth which are uh, having fluorosis uh, am i right shiraz you, you mean to say the etching technique differs from a normal it, tooth the, fluorosis it's, just, it's the same it's the same you have to etch for a longer time longer time the time mm -hmm. of yeah you have to because of the for a longer time probably yeah. for, for because a minute here here instead of hydroxyapatite you have fluorapatite uh, more of fluorapatite being there in fluorous uh, teeth so the etching yeah. i i have a personal query on this one because there are certain fluorosed tooth Where the enamel is not very strong because of talking about hypomineralized, hypomineralized. There, of course, then again, have to, yeah. Then you have fluorosis. Again, you have many different types. Many types, yeah. So exactly uh, what uh, the quality the of enamel. 
uh, is yeah the tooth the tooth substrate because of fluorosis is itself very fragile in some cases yeah that's what in hypomineralized uh, you cannot etch for so long you in fact you are not so supposed depends, to depends i think on uh, this in fact the bonding itself is uh, questionable there you know can i ask abra to put some throw some insights on this please yeah. on on fluorosis is it fluoros teeth on fluoros teeth what do we generally do here do we etch or do we directly bond them no we we still have to etch but uh, if it's hypomineralized because that's weaker enamel you got to yeah. be a bit more careful so limited less, lesser, lesser time. time yes lesser yes. time yeah lesser time absolutely and uh, so yeah. anything with this fluorosis perhaps maybe a bit longer okay here the the enamel is amorphous it's the structure of ena enamel is not uh, rods it is more um, more of amorphous like how we have in uh, uh, Um, deciduous teeth, so you need to uh, be very careful, and you have to etch it for a lesser time. But if the enamel quality is good uh, and still it is fluorous, you etch it for a longer time. Okay, guys, we have you know an array of questions posted here. We'll go uh, far. Yeah, we'll go, go for it. Go fast. for it. Yeah. Uh, what's the name of the strips used interdentally to remove stains and plaque, Doctor Wahid? Actually, I you I had used a, a stock image from Google. Personally, in clinic, I have a strip from TDV Septodon. Right. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Muhammad Abu Bakr. Uh, I think this question was already answered. What is the concentration of chlorhexidine to be used before bonding? You said two to four percent. Skip it. Skip it. Yeah. So the questions which are already asked, I'm going to skip that. Uh, okay. What would happen if you don't remove pre-existing composite before doing build-up? uh i am not able to understand this question if, what if, would happen if you don't remove pre existing composite before doing build up now basically the old filling whatever is left yeah. on the tooth so okay. I mean, only in case of fractured filling uh, is it about yeah. pre endodontic build up or uh, regular yeah, for for i think i think it's for a general purpose if you have a pre existing composite filling and you you're planning to put a let's just say you're planning to re, re, restore the tooth again or you're planning to build it for a um, core before a crown or even for that matter pre endodontic build up what do you generally do generally if you don't, if you don't remove that pre existing filling uh, basically strength wise uh, things i am of the opinion that all the old dentistry must go before i do a fresh work whether it yeah. is a crown or uh, anything all the previous dentistry i will just dismantle so that i get a clear picture of what's going underneath because there can be secondary things micro leakage under the pre existing restoration so it's always better to remove the previous restoration before absolutely. going ahead. absolutely i agree with you okay the next question is from dr bushra uh, i think this question is quite difficult to answer i think so what are the instructions do we give to the patients to prevent discoloration of restoration i think uh instead patient should give instruction to the dentist that <laughs> polish it well enough so that it doesn't discolor yeah great i think i think it's quite you know it's uh, discoloration is inevitable doctor why what do you say uh see my i my my experience is just of uh, let's say the maximum amount i think follow two to three years of follow up that's the max i have Right, It's right. Composite right. restoration. So I, I am not in a position to uh, answer much about it. See, can I add something here? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, please, please. See, when I was doing my post graduation, the topic uh, for my thesis was uh, uh, something to do with uh, this aesthetic restorative materials and the staining of it. And what I had come across that time was uh, this: uh, the stain, uh, these composites take up the stain up to uh, a period of a week, right? Uh, So, see, basically, in composite, we are talking about uh, polymerization, the conversion rate. Okay. Uh, so, in fact, when we finish a composite, the conversion rate is probably around seventy to eighty uh, percent. After twenty-four hours, maybe around ninety, ninety-five. Hundred percent conversion, uh, if I'm not wrong, occurs only after a week. So, what I generally do is, when I do aesthetic restoration, I ask the patient not to take uh, food which has, uh, you know, colors in it. for almost up to a week and the initial days are very critical uh, because of the sorp sorption abilities of this comp uh, composite they take up the stain very uh, you know fast uh, especially in the initial days so that's what i generally follow 
Okay, uh, the next question is from Dr. Seaman Shah. She asks, sandblasting to be used only for diastema cases or can it be used for fracture cases or can it be used for even cavity prep or to remove plaque? Sandblasting. Before I go, yeah, before you go ahead, I just wanted to uh, clarify. I think what they are, what uh, Dr. Shah wants to know is um, what's the purpose of sandblasting, to be honest? Yeah, it makes sense. In simple actually. terms, what's the purpose of sandblasting? So I think, Abrar, can you please take up this question, if you don't mind? I mean, the idea of sandblasting is, you know, you're creating more porosity. You know, yes, you are getting rid of all the, uh, you know, any plaque, remnants of plaque, but it's very aggressive. I mean, the reason why I personally would use sandblasting is uh, I would tend to avoid composites if I can. Because as long as the tooth is clean and you know, I'm doing a proper etch, that, that serves the purpose. Yes, sandblasting, I tend to do it to more, mainly to say if I have any adhesive bridges where I need to sandblast the, the metal surfaces to stick back on. Yes, that's, that's where I tend to use the sandblast. Uh, I think there's a confusion yes, here about sandblasting and air abrasion technique. Uh, I think Dr. Abdra is talking about more of sandblasting, which, you know, uh, in processes, what they used to do. I think what yes. Abdul Wahid and what... Uh, I, I mentioned... Uh, I mean, I mentioned that I, I, I think I forgot to mention one thing while I was speaking about this sandblasting thing that we have a different, a lot of things are available in the market, but the equipment which gives us more control over the particle size, over the pressure will be of much use because then we will be able to control the amount of abrasion required about we will be able to control the particle size of the abrasion particles and the pressure. So you're so, actually using an air abrasive. Uh, equipment, not a sandblaster. Yeah. That's what I. Equacare, I think, that it gives us all the. I think the particles are uh, aluminum oxide, right? Yes. yes, aluminum oxide. It's basically for air. It's for air, air, air abrasion. abrasion. And air abrasion. Uh, what? Uh, actually, these uh, the question. What uh, I think is, see, in deep uh, fissures, where we suspect there could be some caries, uh, we, we are talking about this pit and fissure sealing uh, and all that restorations, there it is indicated this air abrasion is done in these fissures to open up the fissures to view the lower uh, innermost areas and then uh, evaluate whether you need to even uh, remove the caries if it, if it is present. Otherwise, you can directly go for pit and fissure sealing. I mean, if people, that's what I understand with this air abrasion technique. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Abra. You can just continue what you were saying. No, sorry. I think sorry you've covered that. So that that I mean, airflow. What we call this as airflow is one technique what we use to remove all the stains, which is the aluminium oxide. Uh, but personally, I tend to avoid the sandblasting. All right, fine. The next question is uh, from Dr. Muhammad Abu Bakr. He asks, which is the best bird to remove composites after ortho treatment without injury to the enamel? Dr. Wahid. Technique. I think instead of using birds, I would use a slow, soft flex discs, which will give me more control. So you mean to say birds are contraindicated to remove uh, composites? No. When, whenever it comes to using tools, it's all about your uh, control and technique. A person can, a, a, a clinician who has more control with the birds can be better with birth instead of uh, a slow speed one. So if you feel comfortable, if you feel that you have enough control over your hand, then you can go ahead. But uh, as a, in general, slower the speed and uh, the more variety of the grit, the pores, the fine, the better the procedure. So I would use softless disc rather than bird. Right. And if it, if, even if it is bird, then a slow speed will be much better. Right. And uh, the next question is from Dr. Asmat. She says, uh, a small note on sensitivity after composites, after composite restoration. I think that would be voluminous to answer. Can you concise that and answer, please? Uh, I, I'll just highlight few of the points, which are uh, the main, most common ones. Obviously, the most common one is the case selection, right? How deep, whether the, whether the case should go with the liner, without liner, uh, what, what, what was the reason of the sensitivity, whether, was the, whether the sensitivity was pre-existing and the patient came with the... Uh, complaint of sensitivity, right? The patient can come with a complaint of sensitivity and the reason of the sensitivity may be uh, related to occlusion or the pulp. But let's say if the patient had come for a restoration and there was no previously existing sensitivity, 
then the reason might be with the acid etch technique maybe excess of etching if not excess of drying you dry the tooth excess and the collagen fibers are collapsed then it may be the reason of the dentin sensitivity uh, other than that uh, contamination contamination before the bonding if there is micro if there is contamination there won't be proper bonding and there will be leakage it may again result in the sensitivity right 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 i think it's a very vast chapter to cover i guess with a, such a yeah. short period of time and just sorry just to add on to it i would say even the occlusion yes uh, even occlusion takes, takes, uh, high point as well any any uh, high points and potentially can cause uh, high sensitivity right fine dr shiraz you want to you want to add on you want to add anything please no if uh, the uh, i think the main criteria here is uh, the bonding if you have a very good bond and the cavo surface is uh, sealed properly uh, half the battle is won so you you have to uh, take care of uh, take care of the bonding okay uh, this is my personal query uh, the composite restorations uh, you reckon indirect or direct technique yeah? which which is more better in terms of preventing post op sensitivity when you are doing a, a inlay particularly inlay uh, uh, is it better is it better to do direct or indirect you mean to say uh, inlays with composites yeah yeah indirect composites yeah yeah i think we should do a study on that <laughs> i think I for think inlays we generally go with ceramic or metal or whatever we yeah. generally do for uh, because i think if we are doing indirect whether it is composite only or uh, ceramic only we will be doing uh, immediate dentin sealing anyway so it, it will in, it will kind of help in reducing the sensitivity but again when you are doing immediate dentin sensitivity right. i have next question from dr simen shah yeah i'll just go I, i'm i'm just you know going forward with, with the new questions uh if we if we do chlorhexidine if we use chlorhexidine after etching will it lead to desiccation or will it would lead to desiccation that's what they are saying and how yeah. how to bleach with composite restorations will they have to be replaced following the procedure i i didn't understand how would chlorhexidine lead to desiccation yeah that's what they are asking it won't it won't lead to this it won't lead to it is, it is an aqueous solution so it, it's it's there are no chances desiccation will happen uh, only if you use compressed air Yeah. The next question of uh, the same gentleman or lady is how to bleach um, with composite restorations. Do you have to replace them after bleaching? I think it's uh, it's better to do your all bleaching procedure before the composite restorations. Brilliant. So let's take one from Dr. Firdos. Uh, I'm going to unmute him so he can ask the question. Can you unmute yourself, uh, Nair Sab? Please. Uh, Wahid, actually, it was a very comprehensive and uh, very uh, beautiful presentation. Yeah, uh, we you. had a lot of uh, feed forwards from a lot of participants before we put in your uh, uh, flyer in the group. A lot of people were very impressed about your uh, intentional discolorations. I mean, uh, we spoke so much about uh, discolorations. Now let's talk about intentional discolorations, as in uh, occlusal staining. Uh, what are your tips on uh, occlusal staining i think you missed this on your uh, tips in your presentation uh, uh, i i didn't go much in detail about this uh, staining part because it has less of functional relevance and it's just something which we do for pleasing ourselves and the patient uh, i did mention about it in the slide which i uh, when i said minimalist approach uh, whenever we are using stains less is more so as less as possible and how do i place it i didn't had any documented pictures of uh, how i place but i can mention it now i use an old uh, sterilized number 10 file i take stain and uh, i apply minimally and then i use my micro brush to spread it along the grooves and uh, uh, i spread it so in in such a manner that i looked at the adjacent tooth right the appearance the darkness uh, the stain should look as natural as possible and as light as possible and it is also something related to the the way you have created your uh, morphology the grooves whether they are shallow or whether they are deep and accordingly your stains will take up that area 
and uh, i don't use uh, much of uh, let's say 3d in 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 interior cases the way they do 3d morphology like layering uh, i don't use like white stains blue stain ochre for uh, 3d uh, layering i just use it on the posteriors sometimes but but why do you need uh, one, posteriors dr wahid i really don't it, understand is it uh, one satisfaction no no, func no, no functional relevance it is, it is not required at all and it is uh, uh, wahid one request from me for you can you please uh, uh, put a video in the group uh, regarding how you do that uh, staining uh, i think uh, we need to wait for that because uh, as soon whenever i get back to the clinic okay i'll try to make a video about it making videos it's bit assalamu alaikum uh, it's been late but uh, i just need to ask a question like uh, what's the need to put stains why you need separate stains why why can't you use shades which are like a3 a3.5 and you can use it uh, as stains you don't uh, need stains which are darker than that even the occlusal surface if you see you cannot uh, you don't don't need something which is more dark than that you can use uh, a3.5 or uh, a3 uh, flowable and you can use it as a shade as a stain sorry before you go ahead uh, do you mind introducing yourself uh, galaxy 8 s8 Yeah, my name is Dr. Shahdeh Khan. I'm from Bombay, and uh, I was a bit late because there was some network issue. So I directly joined into the question answer session. Right, right, right. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I think uh, he is confused with the. I... I, yeah, uh, stains is different from our shades of composites. Stains are something we which we give. I think he is uh, the the person who asked the question is uh, confused with the staining which we are talking and uh, the staining which. Uh, i think talking about right right wahid yes there was some confusion on this part because stains is not something uh, shades of the composite and stain are totally yes. different stains is something yes. used to make characterization and uh, yes. there may be truth in the patient's mouth where where uh, the patient might have white patches on the occlusal surface on the adjacent teeth and if you want to just recreate it for just for the patient satisfaction and aesthetic reasons we might use a white stain and so on and so forth okay, uh, can we have uh, can we have dr seeman shah can you unmute yourself and ask the question please because you have couple of questions bundled together it's difficult to you know uh, keep a track of all the questions can you can you unmute yourself dr seeman <clears throat> dr seeman shah okay her her question is dr seeman's question is uh, what i meant if we don't use chlorhexidine will it might lead to degradation of collagen fibers that was a question previously the as as the paper in the mechanism suggests that if the uh, if you are using uh, if you are not using mmp inhibitors the uh, the enzyme which is activated because of the acid etching and the dental caries process will over a period of time will degrade the hybrid layer so it's not something that will come forth in within few weeks but it will re uh, reduce the life of the restoration as compared to using mmp inhibitors right and and how long will you etch and treat it to dr wahid as i said earlier within 15 to 90 seconds it's uh, fine and uh, it depends how because again the enamel in case of atrited tooth rather than worrying about the etching i'm more worried about enamel in atrited tooth most of the enamel is lost and we have very little to bond to the tooth surface at times i find myself in a difficult position when patient comes with a class 2 on a atrited tooth because after removing caries and already atrited tooth there is hardly any enamel left to do a proper restoration so the uh, usually within the range of 15 to 60 seconds i have never personally i have never went above 30 seconds at the max most of the time it is within 30 seconds and it suffices right and how important you said you know warming of composites in your clinic before restoration how will it change the treatment outcome when you don't warm your composite and when you use your composite directly at room temperature he composite which are heated to a temperature of like 55 degree to 60 celsius 
right it increases the mechanical properties of composite gives you an additional edge it it doesn't mean that if person is not using heated composite he won't be able to get a proper restoration it's right. it's just like an additional step to get a better stronger response uh, should we be using the same co company composites if you're using you know a multiple composites like a2 a3 shades can you mix and match composites from different company will that affect the outcome I, I I don't have much experience regarding this because mostly I use a single single company because to keep the my keep my inventory limited I don't have a uh, different varieties of composites. Uh, Dr. Abra, your take on this? I think it's always good to stick to the same uh, manufacturer. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, if you're using say in one particular given uh, case. Doctor, why there was Doctor, why there was no confusion about the uh, stain things? Uh, I was very clear about it because it, it's all about working in the most uh, uh, economic way with the best available things you have. Not all the dentists have those uh, number of uh, syringes or num number of uh, different things which they can use. So whatever we have, the WBT. Now you talked about the white patches or something like that. Usually in my practice, I can do it using the B2 shades. I can do it with the B1 shades and about the dark stains which we need for the occlusal surfaces, uh, I can do it with the A3, A3.5. So that was the point about why not using a stain in particular and how you can use the composites or the shades which are available with you. This is the first. Second thing, after hearing about the strength, uh, after heating the composites to a temperature which is like 55 or 60 degrees Celsius and getting a more strength, more desirable strength. So when composites are manufactured, composites are manufactured in a way that it is stable only at room temperatures. It is stable only room temperatures that is 28 degree to 30 degrees Celsius. Be it any country, irrespective of any country and whatever the temperature there will be. But the room temperature should be 28 to 30. So when you keep it in a refrigerator, some doctors keep it in a refrigerator at a cool temperature. And when they use it, it becomes, it tends to become more sticky. And if you heat it, I don't know how, which company composites you're using and how it does not change its characteristic. But if you heat it to 55 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Celsius, there the, the workability will change because it will not remain the same. The consistency will change. So it, it, it will highly affect your workability. I get your question. And uh, there, are, there are like uh, articles and everything which says, and uh, I will be sharing it, that it says it will enhance the mechanical properties. I also agree that heating the composite will increase the flow, right? It won't be packable kind of consistency anymore. And that is why whenever we are using heated composite, we are using it with compules and guns. And more often when you're using a heated composite, we are not uh, aiming to create those kinds of morphology and grooves because it's difficult to maneuver with the high increased flow. It's more like, uh, let's say, for example, when we're using a bioclear restoration, when they are giving a minimal occlusal morphology and just focusing on the functional part. So just a uh, minimal morphology and no groups and everything, just functional composite restoration. And yes, we can't give that kind of grooves with the heated composite. Regarding the uh, shades which you mentioned, stains are not must, they are not required. It's just something aesthetic. Without using stain, you can get a proper good restoration and they are not required. It's just a matter of personal choice. If you want to use and you just want to use, you can use. And if you, let's say if you don't prefer to use the stains, it's all right. And, and again, dentistry is an art. So if, if a person can create the visual effect and characteristics by using conventional shades like B1 and et cetera, that's well and good. As long as the patient and the dentist is happy and the restoration is good, it's fine. And it's just a personal preference, not at all compulsory required. Sorry, we missed one question beforehand. We missed one question. This is from Dr. Farwiz. Um, how about using 10% polyacrylic acid as dentine conditioner instead of... We, we, finished, we finished that, Dr. Mubarak. We finished, we finished oh, sorry, Mubarak. Be attentive, be attentive. I think Dr. Farwiz... <laughs> Okay, uh, we're just going to finish with a few more questions, two or three questions max, then we are going to call it a day. The next question is, uh, is from Dr. Bushra. Is it advisable to bond the piece of broken composite restoration if it is, in, if is it intact or go for a new restoration? I think uh, she's 
asking for a particularly anterior restoration, composite restoration when they come with a fractured composite hanging in the tooth. Can we rebond that or should we go ahead with the new restoration itself? I, as I, I prefer all previous and old dentistry should go before I proceed with my new work. So I won't, I won't like to bond it again. I will just do a new. Right. Uh, uh, any, any take, uh, Dr. Rabra? I mean, any procedure you do, you've got to weigh the benefits and the risks what you have. Okay. And, uh, the general, yes, the general rule is, yes, take the whole thing out, redo it. But if you've done the filling, you know, it's all fine. And uh, if it's just a small chip, yes, you've got to see what the reason for the chip is. And you've got to try and get rid of the, the problem which is causing the chip in terms of occlusion or any other factor which is there that has to be dealt with. If it's a small chip, yes, I've done cases where I've repaired it and it seemed to work fine. Yes, you have to keep a close eye on that. And you have a follow-up? Yes, yes, yeah, you do have, have follow-up. Yeah, you see patients regularly. Then you, okay. you monitor that. But for any given case, if it fractures again, yes, you've got to take <clears> the whole thing out and revisit the whole process. But again, it all, it's all case specific. Right, right. right. And if it's, if it's, yeah. Yeah. One, one more question to Dr. White is uh, about his personal. Uh... Yes. One more question is regarding his personal choice. Like, uh, it's about the workability. If you have a sticky composite, so what happens is you cannot mold the occlusal surfaces. You cannot shape it properly. So do you prefer doing it directly with the composite if it is non-sticky or you use a burr to properly carve the occlusal surfaces? I don't because think we can use a burr to give a proper occlusal morphology. The kind of dexterity to do so will be uh, very, very, very commendable, difficult, I haven't seen. And when you're saying the composite is too sticky, right? So um, most of the good quality composites are uh, known for their consistency, the kind of consistency which give you ease of operation. So if the composite consistency, one whichever you're using, if you're not satisfied with it, it's better to switch on to some other better quality composites, which will be much easier to work with. I think uh, he's a little bit confused more about the consistency of these composites. Uh, can you just put some light uh, probably on the kind of composites which you try to choose, like uh, say nano composites? See, uh, it, it's not about uh, the, the direct, see, in my, in my opinion, it's not about the pillars like spherical or the nano and uh, uh, it's about the company, the manufacturer. Because there are there are certain companies which are like preparing no matter which 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 composite. Let's say a certain X compo company is very much famous for good quality composite, right? From same company, if you get a nano field or a hybrid or some other composite, almost all of them will be having a good workability. Brilliant, uh, Doctor Wahid. Fine. I think we are. Which company do you? We, which company do you think has good workability? Because uh, in the previous question, like you asked, right? like when you uh, I'll, I'll just uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll mention few names. I don't have any conflict of oh, financial association with this composite companies. But uh, personally, I like GC the best. GC composite G Daniel is very good. It's very expensive, but it is good. Other than uh, that, uh, 3M Z350 is good. And uh, if we consider but when you heat it, but when you heat it in your practice, like to 55 degree or 60 degree Celsius, it becomes sticky. So the workability is uh, that's what, uh, I what said. You can say the workability is affected. That's what I said. When we are using heated composite, we are not focusing on the giving kind of fancy uh, anatomies. We are just trying to give a proper respiration with just let's say minimal amount of uh, occlusal morphology. Right. Sorry, I have to interrupt. Uh, Galaxy S8, sorry, is that Dr. Khan? Dr. Shadab Khan, yeah? Yes, yes, uh, yeah. You can continue your questions in the group, please, because we are time restrained here. Um, if anybody else mm -hmm. has any more questions, we'd like to you to please go ahead and uh, continue with the discussion in the group. I, I would have like... A... Sorry, go on, please, Abdul. I have a just personal uh, question, like just I would like to know your opinion regarding this anterior 3D layering. It's very good 
very technique sensitive but uh, being a dentist i i am a dentist i know what is an incisal hello i know what are mammalians right but in my life even after being a dentist while speaking to other person i have never noticed the hellos or uh, i never noticed speaking to other person the incisal uh, mammalians and etc so if a being dentist a person knowing having knowledge of all these things while speaking to other person never notices this kind of thing do we think a patient uh, will appreciate this work and do we think it is uh, it's it's worthwhile giving all those 3d layering in anterior composite creating mammalians and incisal hello and everything what's so your my, personal take on my this? personal my personal you want my personal opinion yes yes just a personal no. take no you don't you don't actually replicate the uh, a 19 year olds in a 50 year old or a 40 year old because these mammalons don't last for life neither do yes. your cusps neither do your grooves neither do those stainings and other things so technically speaking i don't uh, approve of that kind of uh, dentistry where you try to replicate something where the, you try to tell the patient you're going to look like how you were when you were 18 or 20 because it's uh, practically unfeasible aesthetically unappealing and secondly they won't la they won't last because of all the occlusal changes. So personally, I wouldn't go into that kind of uh, scenario, but I would try to replicate the other teeth, the adjacent teeth. Yeah, the shade and the contour. Yeah, yeah, you just absolutely. have to see the adjacent teeth and then only try to replicate it. Absolutely. If, as Dr. Mubarak said, if it is an older patient who, you know, the, even the, uh, the, the kind of enamel would have been, you know, lost, you wouldn't try to do all these things. You would just try to give a simple restoration. I think uh, one more important thing is uh, contours of the tooth are uh, more important uh, than aesthetics. Because uh, contour plays a very big role in uh, uh, you know diverting the food when the patient is uh, in function. So which if you don't give a proper contour, suppose you're doing a buccal uh, extension uh, restoration, if you don't give a proper uh, belly, and you uh, give a flat belly and uh, when the patient chews the force uh, because of the force the food directly gets impinged onto the uh, buccal sulcus buccal gingival sulcus yeah, so contours of contours, are uh, yeah. yes yes function contours over are function more. presides over the aesthetics absolutely yes. contours are absolutely. Very, I think that's, very important that's in one simple uh, term right i'm, I'm going to conclude this yeah. Sorry, uh, I apologize, but I think we've run too much into time. But thank you, Dr. Wahid. It was a brilliant talk. Thank you, everyone. And I thank the panel members as well for providing us their insights and their views. If you have thank any you. queries, any questions, any further questions, please proceed and we will continue the conversation in the group. Uh, we will proceed with uh, new speakers. We are looking for new speakers. So hopefully we will be planning everything ahead before we you know, send out the flyers for the next talk. But thank you all. Um, I am going to conclude the meeting, but hopefully you guys all enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Thank you. 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 Thank you.